Well, today I'm invited by X Matters in their kitchen, and Travis Depew is going to walk me through how they went through this journey of migrating from monolithic application into microservices on Google Cloud Platform. Thank you, Travis, for having me over. Thanks for coming. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited to actually cook with you today and to eat because that's what I like to do. But before we do that, I would love to learn more about X Matters and what the tool does. We help keep digital services up and running. Mm -hmm. We do that by tracking down the current on-call resources, delivering notifications to them, and letting them initiate workflow. So what the tool basically does is it takes the times when there's spikes in traffic or spikes in error rates, and then it notifies the right teams. But that stuff is really hard to do. How do you understand all of that from, and, and also very complicated? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is hard um, and important critical work, you know, for the industries today. Um, and there's, once you get the notifications, you know, that's just the beginning of the process a lot. There's, you know, steps that have to happen after that. And so that's called toil, you know, important manual work that needs to be done, but it takes away time from troubleshooting the issue. Exactly. So we can help in, uh, automate a lot of that process. This sounds obviously very exciting. I'm interested in seeing the tool. Can you show me how this works? Yeah, sure. I have my computer right here. Awesome. Here we see part of the X Matters Flow Designer Canvas showing a stack driver alarm workflow. The first step is the inbound HTTP trigger that parses the payload and kicks things off. Then we start enriching the alarm with some metadata that Stackdriver might not have. In this case, we're getting the last commit and deployment info from GitHub and Jenkins. And finally, this is where we actually fired the XMatters event to notify people. Here we see Dan receiving the Stackdriver notification on his mobile device. He reviews the stock info from Stackdriver, but then he can review the enriched data from GitHub and Jenkins. He has a couple different response options, but he decided this is severe enough that he needs to roll back to the blue deployment from the current green deployment. So he selects a response option and adds an optional comment. Back in the XMatters canvas, we see the various flows that kick off when a user selects the relevant response option. Each organization has major incidents and processes around kicking those off. In this case, we see that XMatters will automate creating a Jira issue, and then a status page incident, and finally a Slack channel so that teams can start collaborating. We also see a rollback to blue that Dan selected, and we see that a new Jira issue is created before triggering the redeploy using a Kubernetes command. The Jira issue helps keep track of who triggered the deployment and when, and also serves as a record for future investigation. The last one is my favorite, though. Using a playbook tool such as Ansible, we can go trigger an existing playbook to attempt to remediate the problem. There are limitless possibilities, and all this can be tailored in the specific processes of the organization. I can imagine how this application must have looked uh, originally. So I am super excited to learn how you guys managed to take all these services and separate them out and create microservices out of them. But before we do that, I want to know what we're cooking today. We're cooking vegetable soup, and I think it's going to be pretty tasty. OK, Travis, so where do we start? I'm super excited looking at all these veggies. Yeah, we're going to chop them all up. So we got some. Celery, some parsley, uh, we got some carrots and some cheese. Corn and colorful tomatoes. Ah, good start. Okay, so Travis, what do you think about the difference between monoliths and microservices? How would you define it? Well, if you think of a monolith like a turducken, you know, that meat monstrosity that's the chicken inside of the duck, inside of the turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot like a uh, turducken, monoliths, you know, are very intertwined, everything's all um, put together and rolling out new turduckens is very hard Yeah, to rebuild each one. Just like, you know, when you're trying to build something and you have all the things connected to each other and uh, they're dependent on each other and you don't know which one to take apart because the other things might, might mess up. Exactly. Got yep. it. Okay. Conversely, uh, microservices are a lot like cupcakes, right? If you have multiple flavors of cupcakes and you want to change one little thing in the recipe, you can then change the recipe bake a bunch of new cupcakes and your customers get to have all the greatest and latest cupcakes. Well, that was the most delicious explanation of the difference between monoliths and microservices that I have heard. So Travis, what were some of the main challenges that you all were going through while you had this monolith turducken setting of the architecture? Um, I'm pretty sure there were challenges that, that made you think that moving to microservices was a good choice. Uh, what were some of those challenges? Well, 
Uh, we had monitoring and debugging challenges. So each customer essentially ended up in their own instance. And uh, so trying to track down issues and trying to tell what the health of the applications were was really difficult. Um, we also found that it was taking days, if not weeks, to uh, get new customers onboarded, which certainly isn't scalable. I'm actually curious about how the infrastructure was initially when it was a monolith. Yeah, so originally we had CDs that we would send out to customers. Um, we were, you know, it was an on-premise application. So we decided to take that and just put it into the cloud, naturally. Um, and unfortunately, what this meant is that we ballooned into 5,000 different VMs, which, as I mentioned, isn't scalable. Yeah, so as you start to have 5,000 VMs, that definitely is a lot. I'm assuming you started to think you needed to move to cloud. Um, what was that? What was that thought process like? Uh, we rented space in six different data centers across the world. So uh, we we thought about why are we getting into dealing with hardware? You know, Google does that very very well. So why don't we leave it to the experts? What were some of the architectural components at a high level that you were looking at as a part of? microservices architecture. Yeah, so naturally we had the application was composed of several different pieces. So we had the web user interface, we had API um, interfaces, um, and we also have like notification services. So being able to reach out to email or SMS or voice calls were all their own kind of service. Um, then there was also the on-call scheduling. So trying to figure out you know who's currently on call. Um, and so these were kind of early things we were able to identify that we could pull apart and tease out of the application to make them their own service. When you all were starting to move to microservices, what was the end goal in mind? Uh, primarily scale. Uh, maintaining 5,000 VMs is just not scalable. So we tried to identify different aspects that we could pull out some of the redundancy. So for example, we have this application gateway that's feeding traffic into the different services. Mm -hmm. So we were able to identify different places that we can start to move to our microservices. And then, so um, how did that start to look in Google Cloud from the architectural perspective? What are the components you were using? Yeah, so we had a web user interface. Um, we had application APIs. Mm -hmm. um, we had notification services and on-call scheduling. So all of these were different microservices that we were able to pull out and break off into their own, into their own microservice. So application gateway approach really sounds um, interesting and the natural thing to do when you're starting out with microservices and breaking up your monolith. Uh, what are the components that you ended up using on Google Cloud? What did the architecture look like? So we use Google DNS for IP address lookup. And then users are routed through the global load balancer, and then uh, which gets them into the application gateway. So from there, uh, the user devices, such as web and mobile devices, are routed into the various microservices that are all running on GKE using images stored in Google Container Registry. The data backend is running on Google Compute Engine. Then we have the monitoring running also using Prometheus, Splunk, and of course, Stackdriver. Now, when you decided to actually get the GKE services on, what were some of the services that you picked out or selected from the monolith that, that were going to go on? As What was the decision-making process around that? And what were some of those services? So the application is composed of many different uh, pieces. So it made logical sense to pull those different pieces apart into their own services. So for example, we have the web user interface, provides the web interface you know, for the various users. Um, then we have the API interfaces, as well as uh, like on-call scheduling. So it was its own service to figure out, OK, who's currently on call when an event comes in? Um, and then there's the data services, you know, keeping track of users and their devices and things like that. So that brings up a very interesting and a very important point when it, when you, when it comes to migrating monoliths to microservices because data dependencies are key. And every service um, has some sort of dependency on another service. So uh, this question always comes up as to how do you actually define which uh, services should be migrated first or um, how do you deal with those data dependencies? Yeah, certainly ser microservices, you know, are very rarely just standalone services. You know, they always depend on other pieces. Um, so we just really made sure to release the services in cadence with each other um, as, we, as we started to build out the application. 
Yeah, so mainly just making sure that um, you list out those services that you may want to move to microservices and then you define the dependencies and then depending on which one's dependent on e each other or less dependent on each other, you define which one goes first versus next. Yep. Okay. Well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So we have a bunch of chopped wedgies here. What do we do next? Uh, we're going to throw them in the pan and then we'll add in the broth. Ah, oh, awesome. Yeah. Let's do it. This definitely seems like a pretty difficult and daunting task. How long did it actually take to finish out the entire migration process? Well, once we made the decision to commit to cloud, it took us about 12 months because we had data center contracts that were coming up for renewal. So it was either get our stuff out or buy more data center. Yeah, yeah. well, those are obviously very good situations to kind of push you towards um, a good timeline. Was there a time when you were running in GCP as well as in your on-premise environment? Yeah, uh, we were running them both for about six months. Uh, the flexibility of the Google Cloud Platform allowed us to do that. Well, it always seems that it's important to understand that the beauty of migration is you're not going to just move stuff from here to here. It's always going to be a gradual process where you move some services over um, and you have both platforms running for at least a, a considerable amount of time so you can go back and forth between platforms. Um, seems like that's what X Matters ended up doing. You had six months in uh, Google Cloud and, and also running parallelly in on-premises um, in order to facilitate the migration. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges or rather the success metrics that actually led to that migration? Yeah, so metrics are critical. You know, we started with uh, monitoring and observability um, right out the bat so that we knew that as we introduced changes to the entire environment, we could see how they impacted, you know, the different aspects of the system. So um, Stackdriver, I'm pretty sure, played a really big role in that monitoring uh, journey. But um, I'm pretty curious about a Google Kubernetes engine and how did that play a role in those incremental changes that as you were gradually moving over to cloud? Uh, so GKE is the, definitely the central part of our microservices architecture. Um, we also use GKE VPC native IPs for direct addressing. Um, and then we also use a sidecar pattern for incremental deployments. So Travis, what is the most challenging part of actually moving into microservices pattern? Uh, sorting out the service ownership, so mapping the teams, the different services, um, as well as deploying those services into the environments. We did touch a little bit on like how to find out the services that needed to be migrated and then prioritize them in the sequence um, and all of those things. That That is really hard to do. Should we check on our soup? Because I think it that... It sounds should... like it's getting there. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's do that. So Travis, this change must have been really new for the development and the operations team uh, because they are learning something new, uh, moving into microservices, they are designing things differently, they're working on them differently, the cadence might be different. How did you uh, go about making the development and operations team feel comfortable about the change? Uh, you know, Jez Humble talks about this really well. Um, he says that bad behavior arises when you abstract teams from the consequences of their actions. So we really tried to align the teams with the services that they had to build and maintain. So basically, they will be accountable for the SLOs if you give them more ownership and more accountability for the work that they are doing. So now that you've gone through this migration, what are the impacts that you're starting to see? Well, happier customers mean happier teams. Uh, empirically, we found that we had a 43% performance improvement, as well as 60% less incidents. Well, happy team and happy customers definitely sounds like a win to me. Uh, apart from this, as you are now already into a Google Cloud with the microservices uh, broken down from a monolith, uh, what are you seeing as the next steps? Where do we want to go from the architectural perspective? Well, total domination of the market, of course. <laughs> well, apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> well, architecturally, we'll look into uh, moving into a service mesh architecture. So you're probably using Istio. And uh, that will allow us to get rid of this application gateway and let the microservices talk to each other directly. Yeah, service mesh definitely seems like the next logical step to take where you can connect, secure, control, and observe your applications uh, while in a microservices fashion. Well, awesome. That was very insightful, Travis. Thank you so much for having me over. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us today. I'm glad you were able to catch the recipe of migrating a monolith to microservices with X Matters. If you like this video, then stay tuned for more such episodes of Get Cooking in Cloud.